mean, this is something that you may not consider. And that's the, the thing about the 80s is like we were getting into as much digital stuff as we could, but it was sub analog, which is kind of what made it cool. And it's like yeah. the original digital stuff was much crummier than analog. So you've got these uh, drums that like would trigger even when I didn't hit them. If I just kind of breathed at them or looked at them, it would trigger extra sounds. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Hey, rock stars, it's your host, Lid Shaw, and welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Derek Bostrom a drummer whose music was very important influence on me during my college years and, and continued to be. I discovered his band through my friends who were cooler than me and had better record collections. And I vividly remember watching uh, Derek's band at shows in St. Louis when I was in college and then back in Boston over the summers, but also intently listening to their records on vinyl or on my cassette Walkman while I was working hard in the architecture building during college. This was, of course, before I realized that I didn't want to be an architect and would rather be doing music instead. So you're, you're partly responsible for that, Derek. All right. <laughs> the band is called The Meat Puppets, and you may have heard of them. So here's the full story, and this comes from Derek's own bio. In 1980, Derek Bostrom persuaded Kurt and Chris Kirkwood to give up their mainstream rock aspirations and join him in the burgeoning world of punk rock. As the Meat Puppets, the trio enjoyed 15 years in the American underground, skillfully sidestepping such labels as cowpunk, hardcore, indie, and alternative in order to pursue their own unique musical vision. Simultaneously, seminal and criminally overlooked, I like that, the Meat Puppets have influenced generations of fans with their chemically-induced, high-energy concoction of abstract songwriting, brain-melting guitar work, and ingenious improvisation. They recorded seven albums in the 80s for the legendary SST label, and they released three more albums for London Polygram in the 90s, including Too High to Die, for which they received a gold record and scored the hit Backwater. They are most widely known for their appearance on Nirvana's MTV Unplugged television program and subsequent album. It was the financial success of the Nirvana project, which finally allowed the Meat Puppets to take a long hiatus, during which Kurt moved to Austin Derek became an IT professional, and Chris pursued a drug habit which landed him in a federal prison. Wow. Though Bostrom declined to join the Kirkwoods when they reformed in 2006, he has continued to chronicle the band's history, producing a series of reissues on the Ryko Disc label and promoting his own version of events from his Bost World site. He is also a DJ at LuxuriaMusic.com, where he hosts a weekly show dedicated to sharing his favorite ephemeral pop trash. I like it. Please welcome Derek Bostrom to Recording Studio Rockstars. Derek. Hey, Lidge. Are you ready to rock? I'm ready to rock. Sweet. You, you, you put that in there just to test the levels, right? I'm yeah. ready to rock. Yes, exactly. Here, Shout one into the mic, man. Blow it up for us one time. As Spock would say, I am ready to proceed, Captain. Well done. All right, so um, we got lots to chat about, man. I'm not kidding about you being a big influence on me. Wait, does does that mean that you're more nervous to talk to me than I am to you? Probably, yes. Because this is this is my first opportunity to do a podcast, and I'm very nervous. <laughs> I just just I'm just saying that to put you uh, at edge. I was going to say, I find that hard to believe, man. I imagine you must have been in front of many interviews, but maybe a podcast itself is unique. Well, I'm I'm a podcast fan, so um, I'm 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 always excited to do one. So this is this is my first, and so you know I've been listening to them for years. I've enjoyed yours quite a bit. In fact. Uh, you did the Chris Graham one, uh, and I was like, I don't remember the name of the technique where you you, uh, you you add a second vocal and then you compress it and you mix that in. Parallel compression. I think that's just what I'm missing. So uh, <laughs> I'm going to try that one when I do my show. I'm, I'm still trying to figure out how to mix myself some parallel emotion to just kind of get me through the day. 
<laughs> uh, well, I'll tell you what, uh, my, my secret, this, uh, I don't want to uh, jump ahead too quickly, but one of my favorite drinks is a, uh, aspirin soda, which is just basically water and Alka-Seltzer. So add that to the coffee. Uh, and it's, uh, it definitely perks you up. <laughs> nice aspirin soda. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, so Derek, um, let's kind of go right to the start, man. Tell us what did starting out in music and recording smell like to you? You, you have to ask that, uh, of a meat puppet. Obviously it smelled like pot. <laughs> uh, we, we, uh, I mean, my, I think that first, first started recording probably like 79, um, you know, two tape recorders, uh, uh, dual decks, uh, a friend of mine, uh, who is our original sound man, got a, uh, he got a mixer first and some mics and later got a four track. Uh, he had like one of those, um, hi-fi, um, double, uh, double stereo cassette decks, which uh, we used yeah. to bounce tracks on. And when he got a four track, when we used to like wait till his parents went to bed, uh, go outside, take a couple of bong hits and go in and fool around with the tape recorder. Um, <laughs> some of our first, uh, the first stuff that the meat puppets recorded, we recorded with him. Uh, they, they're, they sound crazy. Uh, there's still some of my favorite things. So, you know, the original, you know, the meat puppets were always trying to get comfortable in the studio. So I would yeah. say that we needed to make the studio smell like grass sometimes. In fact, we had a studio that we recorded in in Paradise Valley, Arizona, which was um, it was actually it was a, a rich couple. Paradise Valley is um, like a rich part of Phoenix. And they had a mobile studio, which they used to record the symphony. And they also uh, had their own studio in the back of their house. Mm -hmm. And it was like. My husband had alcohol problems, and we have a daughter, and we won't allow any pot smoking in the studio. And um, so, of course, uh, the band used to sneak behind it and uh, do that anyway. Got caught, and like the owner of the studio, the, the 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 female of the of the couple were like was was like harsh about it. And so, uh, I remember Kurt uh, complaining about it in an interview, and then later the press was like. The meat puppets are only interested in a studio if they can get high in it. That's their only criteria for music, which, of course, uh, was not true. But, you know, it goes to your question. <laughs> really? Wow. What a, what a trip. I, I remember having this sense or, you know, through the rumor mill, somebody suggesting that there was, a, a, you know, influence of some sort going on in the, the writing and recording process for you. But it was all just you know, speculation on our part. Yeah, speculation and overt suggestion on our part, if you ever read any of the interviews. Yeah. But, um, well, cool, man. Well, uh, a couple of things. One is, um, I imagine, you know, I think we also speculated that you guys were like out in the desert, you know, sort of having shamanistic um, spiritual rituals as part of your music. So I don't know if any of that was true, but maybe you also made us believe that. Uh, I wouldn't say it's not true. I mean... I mean, you if you, you if you if you get me relaxed enough during the interview and you start asking me questions about what's your best advice, what's your favorite tip, it'll all start to come out like, well, you know, you, you know, it's, it's it is a spiritual journey. Yeah. But, I mean, I mean, that's part of the uh, if you're going to talk to an artist instead of an engineer, um, you're going to get a lot more of that, I think, anyway, about the whole, you know, quest for the perfect, et cetera, et cetera. Um, well, I think that's good. And we do want to hear that. And I think whether we're engineering or not, we all, you know, we, we come from some sort of artistry first, probably. I, I agree. I, I mean, mean, one of the interesting things about, um, about what I do now is I got into IT and the contrast between being an artist, a musician, and then being like a support person, uh, which is what I do now, has is so marked. And yet I'm always... You know, referring back to my my days when I was a drummer and, and being in a band, and it like helps me a lot to give me perspective. So, in a lot of ways, I'm I'm doing more engineering style work now. I'm more of a nerd and a gearhead now than I was then. Right. Well, uh, you certainly have to be a gearhead or, or a technician if you're going to be in IT, right? It's in the <laughs> word. It's in the definition. Uh you know, once you've did, once you've uh, cleared enough paper jams, you become a gear non-head. <laughs> um, well, so let's see. I was going to share one quick anecdote about my, please. I think my only experience in Phoenix, Arizona. I was seventeen. We went on a family trip. We rented the big, you know, wooden side station wagon. It was sort of like family vacation for us, and we flew into Phoenix. So this is, this would be just before I discovered, went to college and discovered you guys even. Um, so maybe it was about the first time you were hitting the studio. And so we, we pulled into Phoenix and we're driving around town and 
and finding our hotel where like, it was like a beauty pageant also being hosted there, um, of kids, I think. Oh God. And, and we're going down one of the main roads and I'm in the back and, you know, it's got one of those suicide seats facing out the back of the station wagon. And, we had and, one of those. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm the kid, I'm the 17 year old kid in the back with my hair parted down the middle, looking like Chachi in charge or whatever. <laughs> and I'm reading probably a bad Stephen King novel. And I've got my, uh, my high tops with the fat laces on, which were better for playing hacky sack. Um, so all these things, you know, coalescing into my personality at that age. And we come to a light and, and, you know, the rest of the family's looking forward at the light and up comes this motorcycle right up to the back of the car and some big biker dudes on there. And I'm just like looking out the back window. And then he just looks at me and he just lifts his arm up and he just flips me off right to my face. <laughs> well, that's I was certainly. like, I was like, that was my introduction to Phoenix. I was like, wow, man, this is a, this is a tough town. Well, I, I know um, your your buddy Chris. Um, I, I, I'm sure it wouldn't surprise you. Uh, it sounds like from talking to him that um, this is very much his thing. He somehow managed to um, ingratiate himself into me, into my, uh, to knowing me, and then he's like came out to Phoenix and made me drive him around to all the various places <laughs> right. uh, that we had done things in in Phoenix because he just wanted to know and see them. So uh, that's some some pretty super fan stuff. Yeah. So rock stars. Um... Chris King, who has recently been on the show, singer in my band and, and brilliant writer out of St. Louis, he introduced me to Derek. So he had made this connection with you, Derek, um, mm -hmm. as a writer, sort of post music in a way. Um, and then, uh, and here we are. So glad to have you on the show, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, so now, Derek, I like to ask our guests on the show to start us off with an inspirational quote. Have you got anything to get us inspired to hit the studio and make? make beautiful music or maybe not so beautiful music? Well, um, I use an app called Quotebook on my iPhone. So I'm always collecting interesting quotes. So I've been just kind of going through my favorites. And uh, here's one from a fellow named David Allen who wrote the book, um, Getting Things Done. Yes, I know his name. <laughs> and his quote is like, <laughs> you're asking about the spiritual journey. You must cooperate with yourself and your world in order to transcend resistance and distraction so that you can concentrate. And you must concentrate to clarify the nature of things and how to engage with them cooperatively. All right, now hold up. So take us on a <laughs> take us on a guided tour through that quote for a minute. Oh, uh, God. Well, first of all, it's um, it's a palindrome. <laughs> it's the Is same it really? forward as well. It's the same. Well, not with the words, but in the meaning, okay, it means right. the same thing forwards as backwards. So, um, you need a comp confidence. You need to cooperate with yourself and your world in order to transcend resistance and distraction. So you can concentrate. So in order to concentrate, you've got to learn to cooperate with yourself and you've got to transcend resistance and distraction. Yeah. But, but you must concentrate in order to clarify the nature of things and how to engage with them cooperatively. So it's like, it's basically how do you avoid distraction? How do you maintain your focus? How do you concentrate? And um, yeah, it's like uh, I was just having this discussion with somebody who's an actor um, about this thing called the SAG card, which is a screen <laughs> actor skill, right? And so yep. the the catch twenty two there is that you need a screen actors guild card in order to act in like you know commercial television or or film. But in order to act in a commercial television or film, you need to have a Screen Actors card. <laughs> this is true. Well, so, all right. So I like that um, David Allen's quote. You basically need to sort of accept yourself and get comfortable in your own skin before you can begin to really concentrate on stuff. And, and there's no secret shortcut. There's no secret sauce. You just yeah. have, to, you have to find yourself there. Um, but it's know. cool because it reminds us to, to quit fighting who you are to begin yeah. with, you know? Accept yeah, I mean, it. You got to I mean, start that, there. That's that's kind of it. It's like you're going to ask me down the road, um, what would I tell my younger self? And what I would tell my younger self is you're going to be challenged along the way uh, uh, to not follow your your own instincts mm -hmm. and um, keep doing that. And you're not going to find a shortcut to the experience that you need. You're going to have to live through it. Yeah. One um, one of your fellows was talking about uh, made made a. Uh, allusion to um, Ira Glass's quotes. And um, I think the one he was grasping for is you have to work your way through the suck. Right. <laughs> you have to work your way through the suck. Indeed. Yep. Uh, well, so 
I like that. And I like being reminded that um, we get, need to get to know ourselves. This this came to me recently from a, a rock star who was here for our uh, drum clinic, actually, Rob, Rob Chandler. And he said a really nice thing about listening to the episode with Chris uh, and how much he liked that and how that resonated with him. And I, I responded just saying, you know, thanks. It means a lot to me because that's an interview with a friend who, and that music really represents what I feel is true about myself musically. It feels like home for me, that, that making music with my friends. And it's all just part of that idea that the more we are true to ourselves and our own music and our own nature, the more likely we are to have a real impact, I think, and, and I, really and share I, something valuable. And he really um, showed that well in his interview. But yeah, you really get a good sense of um, a really driven person who's confident and doesn't really, you know, put put many roadblocks in his way. Yeah. And cer certainly, um, you know, you would be surprised how many roadblocks. So this question, you know, having having made a lot of records yourself with me puppets, um, I want to ask you to share a story about an important failure for you. You know, give us a story of a failure moment where you really had a great learning experience or you sort of made it through. Well, um, when we were recording Up on the Sun, uh, which, of course, is the, the record that kind of put us over in the world, you know, ma you know made it possible for us to tour constantly and make a, a you know, a regular living. Yeah. Um, our, our initial attempt to do this record, we actually recorded it. Well, we rented like a quarter inch 16 track. I think it was 16 track. Couldn't have been eight. Uh, it was like a very weird machine. And we rented it from a local, um, uh, you know, music place. And we were going to record the album in, in our friend's um, living room. Nice. And, and we tried all sorts of different ways to do it. And I even got to the point where I didn't, I didn't like the sound very well. And it wasn't a very high fidelity machine because it was a very small tape with a lot of tracks on it. I actually tried overdubbing like the entire kit, one drum at a time. And wow. so, you know, I had, I had my basic track and then I tried to like re overdub the snare and, and the kick drum. And, um, that was going to be very, very time consuming. And, uh, the other guys like nixed it about two weeks into the project. They were like, Oh, we sold the machine. We have to take it back. So the, the project was scrapped. So we ended up booking like three days, um, of lockout time in, in LA and went out there, and uh, and we were just going to ram through it. So suddenly, instead of it becoming kind of a slowly paced album with a lot of you know lush kind of overdubs and, and a slow thing, we had to do it really fast. So we suddenly ran into the studio, and the first thing I noticed was once you know I kind of was having to to re uh, rewrite my my parts for this mm -hmm. new uh, thing, and I go in there and my kick drum was just not tracking. It was like, I was, my, I was hitting too soft, you know, my parts were too busy. Mm -hmm. And so I couldn't, couldn't get a solid sound and it never really occurred to me. And the engineer was like, this is just not working. And, you know, it was like a son of a, a panic moment. I actually had to, to leave the studio and walk around the block for like a half an hour, to get my head together and like reprogram my brain to simplify these uh, kick patterns on the fly so that they would actually record well. Mm -hmm. And, um, so, you know, one of the things I learned was, let's put it this way. The drummer is rarely the guy who gets to decide, <laughs> you know, he needs to be flexible enough to be ready for any number of, uh, of situations, um, you know, cause the other guys are going to need to be comfortable. The drummer has to make the other guys comfortable. And if, if it's not happening for you, even if it is happening for you, it has to happen for them, including mm -hmm. the engineer. And uh, so one of the things I learned, and this was just like my, you know, important failure, it wasn't yet an aha moment, was that y you you really have to be more prepared than you imagine. Oh, um, yeah. At, at the end of the day, I was able to actually to do it um, to my credit. But uh, there was yeah. a couple of, of real panic moments there when I didn't think I was going to be able to to do the session. Wow. Well, so I've got some takeaways from from the story you just shared. Um, the first is you talk about being really prepared. And even though you felt unprepared, just imagine, I mean, you had already worked on the material, it sounds like, quite a lot by doing yep. the first recording of it. So you went through that demo process. You really got to know it before you hit the studio. And then, you know, talking about how you're, you're the last one to decide, or you have to be flexible to accommodate the other guys. 
you know, I often think about how the drums lay down the backbone of a record or of a song mm-hmm. or recording, right? And that's that's pretty obvious. That's an easy thing to say. Anybody could probably say that. I was going to point out uh, an observation hearing you talk about it. It's like, well, why should the drums have to be a backbone? And it's like, okay, that makes sense because they are the backbone to allow everybody else to kind of settle in in and around it. And, you know, you're, you're playing uh, on Me Puppets 2, Up on the Sun, <clears throat> Mirage, you know, three of the records I really knew at the time. They're all, uh, they're, it's very precise, you know. I love those drum sounds. I love your, your playing. I love the sound a great deal, so... Well, that was a, oh, another thing I kind of took away from it is um, you're you're, you're going to want to keep it simple, and that's pretty obvious. Um, you know, it's certainly um, you're going to track if you can get a good drum drum uh, uh, take, then you can overdub the rest of it. Um, but the drummer definitely kind of informs the arrangement, especially in a three piece. Um, he kind of tells the story of the song, uh, kind of lets the uh, you know, the listener in on, on certain things. And, and if you listen to the difference, the difference of the band with me and without me, it's at least it's real obvious to me that, um, you know, I'm missing, mm-hmm. uh, cause I, I can definitely tell what, 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 uh, what story I'm trying to get across when I'm playing. And so that's the other thing. It's like, you're, you know, you, you know, you know, you've got a, a, a guy like Kirk Kirkwood in your band who, who needs to get his thing. He's the songwriter He's the guitarist, you know, he's the featured uh, instrumentalist and the other guys need to find a way to, you know, get their thing across, but yet not be obtrusive. And certainly uh, I always felt like I was um, the, the top man. <laughs> That's part of what what made the the band interesting, as we all thought that. Right. That's part of part of that horrific dynamic that comes from these kinds <laughs> of, uh, um, you know, band relationships. And um, that's what makes it interesting. But. It is a uh, a paradox, just the so, same. So you guys all felt like you were the the secret ingredient that couldn't be uh, that no one could be without, right? Oh, the oh the fights! Oh my god! <laughs> um, when it was time to do the uh, the uh, the reissues for Ryko, you know, I grabbed as many of those uh, tracks as I could fit as bonus tracks on the Up on the Sun disc, and I believe they're still there, and they 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 stand up pretty well. They're not very high fidelity, but you can definitely get a sense of how different our our home recording approach to the album would have been than the three day uh you know fast approach oh you mean you found those original demo tapes and and oh yeah did oh, you yeah. guys actually mix them down so were those part of the Ryko disc re-releases yep great i haven't heard those yet i need to go check those out <laughs> and in fact um that's another example of us like trying to to refit the uh the, these uh, these songs into a three day uh, session. The original version of that didn't have whistling at all. We just came up with that on the spot. That's great. It's brilliant. I mean, it's uh, you. You guys know it was brilliant. I'm sure everybody told you that a million times over. Oh but yeah, that was part of the stuff that was such a hook with that record. <laughs> yep, I know. It's like, oh, listen, they're they're whistling. I couldn't believe people were just like over the moon. Well, let me share this one anecdote actually about you guys. Uh, of what a show that I saw. I saw a, a handful of shows, uh, but one in particular I remember during a summer break in Boston, and I had to go look up the name of the club again. Thank, thank goodness for the internet and somebody, you know, having a page of like old Boston club names. But I think it was called The Channel. The Channel. Yeah. <laughs> sure. And and we saw your show there, and it was absolutely fantastic. Loved it. I had such a good time. Really? And at the, the channel. End- the channel sounded awful on oh, stage. Oh, it didn't matter at all to us, man. It sounded, it was great. Just to see you guys up there playing your music was enough. But you got to the end of the show, and I, th- I guess it was Chris um, who, like, was being kind of wild towards the end, and he rips, he ripped all the bass strings off of his bass guitar, every single one. I told you the the sound on the on the stage is terrible. <laughs> that's that's so, called a temper tantrum. <laughs> yeah, so he ripped off all four strings off his bass, and then he like looked at you, and you you stood up and you looked at him like, no, you don't, and he <laughs> he dove into you, yep. into uh, the drums, and and you were like visibly pissed, and then you just kicked all your drums over and just like they went scattering across the stage, and I just remember you know for me at that point that I was just like. Holy shit, man! This is so rock and roll. All of this, you well, that, know. Well, that's what's so kind of fun about it, obviously. Uh, but these are um, 
I mean, <laughs> this what was this like mid eighties? I assume. Yes, yeah, mid eighties. In nineteen eighty five, we were. I mean, this is the thing. In nineteen eighty five, we did. We here we like did this hail mary pass of a three day lockout session to th- throw this record together, and we were already having trouble with SST. Um, we had recorded Meat Puppets two. We had tracked it in two sessions, like uh, the instrumental tracks, which were great, spot on, beautiful. Vocal tracks. This was the session where Kurt realized that he was having some limitations as a singer. Mm. Before then, we had been real screamy and everything. And for Meat Puppets 2, he realized he did not have the range to cover everything he'd written. So he ended up working really, really hard to break it down into like a kind of a neo falsetto and then a lower voice. And he wasn't really happy with it. Yet we thought it was going to be good. And then SST put us on the shelf for like eight months. Wow. And Spot disappeared. We didn't couldn't get them to like book us a mix session. We finally arranged to uh, get him out to to Phoenix to to do the mix, and the mix was actually done the night Kurt's twins were born, and he was just passed out on the couch the whole time. Um, you can actually hear a piece a plate a spot on the record where the tape had deteriorated from sitting around, mm-hmm. and and so we were like. Um, so we we just were like, well, we're going to do it in three days and get it done so that they can't like shelve it again. And we of course were uh, convinced that they had, they were like trying to put off releasing meat puppets too, because it wasn't punk enough because, and of course we felt like they were giving a greater priority to their other artists who in the meantime were releasing their kind of crossovers from hardcore. And so we really wanted to get this record done. And then, it actually took off. It did really well. And so suddenly we're like higher visibility. We start to get out on the road. We've got a lot of opportunities to play pretty high visibility and we couldn't cut it. I mean, in early 1985, half of our material were like goofy ZZ top and Elvis covers. We could barely record our own, uh, mater- you know, play our own songs live. Yeah. They're and, hard uh, songs. You guys wrote some pretty challenging stuff actually. Yeah. That's one of the things Kurt realized uh, from that experience was, um, especially the Mirage album, which we could not reproduce live. And then you go to Huevos, and people wonder why Mirage and Huevos are so different. It's because Kurt realized, I got to write songs that are easier to play (laughs) because it's killing me. So we get up to New York, and we're doing this fairly high-profile show. And um, Chris basically has sweat his, his, um, you know, through his bass and destroyed the electronics. And... um, it stops working. And so he comes out um, after the, the bass dies and he just comes out on stage and smashes the bass against the, uh, the, uh, the stage and shatters it into a couple of pieces. I'm sure that was a great rock and roll moment. <laughs> yeah, really. Well, um, it was really inspiring to me to see all that. It was fun. I mean, of course, I was out to get drunk and with my best friend and you guys were perfect, you know, well, the, perfect the, evening. The, <laughs> the takeaway here is that um, we were under a lot of pressure to be good, and we wanted to be professional. And our way of of showing how professional we wanted to be was like being completely unprofessional. It's like we were like, what have we gotten ourselves into with this music business crap? Yeah, we just wanted to like blow minds on stage, and so we steadfastly continued to blow minds, and uh, you know. I, I'm I'm not going to say that because uh, Chris dove into my drums, you realized you had to give up architecture. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, it it is um, the you know, it all came out good in the wash. Every uh, one of those little mistakes worked out, you know, really well for in the long run. Maybe it was me witnessing you sort of acknowledge your true nature after Chris <laughs> dove into your drums, and you said, "You know what? This is I, really who I am." Is kick my drum set over, and you just said it's good. <laughs> Oh, it's not like we had a separate set of drums. <laughs> well, so, um, you know, uh, rock stars, let's just put this into context, too. We're talking about mid-80s. You know, we're still like a few years away. We're still like four years away, at least, before Nirvana's breaking on the scene um, and getting really big attention. And then everybody's like, oh, of course you smash your guitar during a show. Yep. Um, but that was that was still to come. So you guys were sort of setting... You're setting the scene for that, and uh, we'll get to that about how um, you influenced Kurt and Nirvana as well. But um, I want to talk to you a little bit more about making these records and the drum sounds, Mm -hmm. because i got to be honest, when I listen to them, 
they inspire me to the level that I want to make drums sound like that today. And I probably have for a long time. I've loved, I would call them sort of close mic dead drum sounds. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I'm, I love that sound. I was actually terrified that you were going to tell me that, that you went in and you just replaced everything with the drum machine. Um, uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, um, they, each one of our records was, was approached very differently. Uh, the, the, the sound on meat puppets too, is probably my favorite mm-hmm. of the bunch. I like the, the sound on the, the first EP, which you can find on the reissue of our first album. Do not like the sound on the first album. Um, meet, meet, uh, up on the sun's a little thin for my tastes. Uh, Kurt really was heavily into the, uh, the Shoals Rockman at the time. So there's a mm-hmm. lot of those tinny compressed guitar sounds on there, which are okay. Um, but Mirage is electronic drums. Mm-hmm. And uh, I had this like weird rolling kit that were of like triangular drums. And uh, boy, they sucked. Uh, <laughs> I, I, we, we spent so much time editing out the, uh, I mean, this is something that you may not consider. And that's the, the thing about um, the eighties is like, we were getting into as much, uh, digital stuff as we could, but it was, it was, it was sub analog, which is kind of what made it cool. And it's like yeah. the original digital stuff was much crummier than analog. So it's, um, it's even cruder. So you've got these uh, drums that like would trigger even when I didn't hit them, if I just kind of breathed at them or looked at them, they would trigger extra sounds. So I'd have to go in and edit out all the extra Un, unrequired, unrequested uh, beats, and uh, yeah, that well, was and you were having to do fun. that off of analog tape, so you're having to like clean yeah, up the tape, right? It definitely uh, did not make for very uh, a very pleasant tracking session. Um, the sounds on Wavos, we kind of went back to the Meat Puppets two sound. They're nice and clean. Um, by that time, I had learned that the drummer really needs to go in the night before. And uh, you got to play the room. And mm-hmm. it's like the, the, the guitarists may not notice as much, but, you know, the, the, the acoustics of the room, the shape of the room, the sound of the room can, really can mess up a drummer. So I eventually had learned you got to go in and get comfortable. You got to learn to play that room. So now on Mirage, it's electronic drums, but it's not a drum machine. It's you playing an electronic pad kit. And, Correct. Uh, and that was what I was listening to it. And I kept thinking they sounded like, you know, drum machine tones are so precise, but it, but the feel was there. And that, that's really cool to hear the story behind it. Yeah, and that's, of course, uh, something that I, I, I labor to do, and it, it slows you down. You, you'd think to get like an immediate sound, um, you just go in and rip, which we had done, but uh, to try to get something that had some, some breath to it that actually felt spontaneous was like, it was a hair-pulling experience. And that was like the main thing we used to care about is like, going into the studio, try to get something that approximated our sound. And not all of the records did that. Uh, you know, it's now monsters, the one that came after Wavos, um, that is actually a, a programming. Well, it's not actually programming. Um, I played a, a electronic kick and snare with like live cymbals and then went in and played a Lindrum for the, the Tom fills. Oh, interesting. So, so it's it's not a completely programmed kit. I I played part of it and then I like pro did the 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 toms. And of course, part of the reasons we tried so many of these different approaches uh, was that we were always pushing up the limitations of our ability. Because um, I was not particularly good. Um, even Chris, uh, you know, as as much as he loved Jaco Pastorius and believed he was God's gift to uh, f- you know finger plucking bass. Uh, yeah. He was messy. He didn't know how to to function in a studio, and um, you know Kurt, you know he was a great guitarist, but none of us had any idea how to how to work a studio. Well, one of the things that's cool about the way it all added up, though, too, is that your drumming is very precise and intentional through the song from start to yep. finish. You're like, we're headed this direction, everybody. I'm I'm not going left. I'm not going right. This is the way we're going. Exactly. And that let left room for the bass and the guitar to, you know, attempt these sort of fancy, fast bits that were like, you know, somewhere between fusion and country. Yeah. And, uh, and the looseness of it made it cool against the drums being like, you know, you're not stopping. Yeah, it was, it was um, I mean, looking back at it, it's like, how do we manage to do all that stuff? It was, uh, I mean, we, 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 we were always in, in, felt like we were in the trenches trying to get our stuff done. And, uh, 
it's interesting to think that you know we we were so dedicated to try to come out with this output which seems kind of random on the face of it but was uh, pretty specific yeah of course then you get into um moving to the uh, the the uh the, the the major label who has insisted that we use producers and so we went with um uh, Pete Anderson, who is, of course, Dwight Yoakam's buddy. And is this and, for uh, Too High to Die? No, this would be for uh, Forbidden Places. Oh, okay. The, the, the one you've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, and he, of course, um, you know, that was, and then I got the opportunity to, like, bring in a drum tech who would tune the drums and make them sound great. And the whole thing was just like, let's track for a drum, uh, you know, the drum uh, performance. And then they literally kicked me out of the, the session, which I was fine with and he was like um it, he his, his little joke was um you can leave now it's a question of mind over matter you don't matter so i don't mind ha 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 <laughs> oh, that's, um, that's encouraging and, that really made yeah. you feel comfortable no and then of course um i heard stories later of them making fun of some of my parts because they weren't pro brand enough you know they weren't slick enough and then of course poor kurt um, had to endure having his vocals flown into place which uh, made him very uncomfortable oh, and wow. um that's a cool record, but it didn't really capture. Well, thing about it was, is like right after Forbidden Places came out, Nirvana broke, and suddenly this notion that the label had that we should, you know, work with a country producer, kind of was like thrown on its ear as grunge became the thing. And then the next record, they insisted that we get a grungier sound. God love them, mm -hmm. and uh, put us up in a studio in Memphis, which the name of which I cannot remember. And it was an oblong room, and I was playing against the the short wall so i was getting a lot of slap back but it actually um it worked well because it gives us that kind of loose feel so that you know that record ended up doing really well and yet it was real difficult to to actually get for me anyway i have to confess that the ones that really hit my radar were me puppets 2 yep. and uh, up on the sun and mirage and and also i remember the ones after that too um, but then kind of, again, when Too High to Die came back out and you guys, I felt like you guys really sort of made this big appearance or reappeared or. Well, that's the nice thing about being in the uh, the in the major label game. Uh, when it's time for them to call in favors, they can do it and then you can get back on people's radar. Yeah. But uh, you you do um, reveal yourself as a as a super geek if you like Mirage. That's <laughs> that's a, a geeky record. And of course, once we moved back into that zz top era uh kind of style of huevos it looks like you kind of backed off some people like huevos best some people like mirage best uh i think i was just distracted and forgotten to pay attention to my <laughs> true self let's talk about um your connection with nirvana and and you know the mtv unplugged experience because that was obviously a really important thing and i mean i still hear those sessions played on the radio all the time yep well, at the time, of course, everybody wanted to play with Nirvana, and Nirvana loved all these bands, and they basically used to give each of the bands they liked maybe three gigs. And so you could get like three gigs with the, the, the number one band in the land. And we happened to um, we had happened to see that um, in, a, in an, a Spin magazine article that uh, Kurt had said that he had played Meat Puppets 2 for Courtney, and she hated it, but he really <laughs> loved it, and he wanted to learn – I think Lake of Fire to do yeah. on this this uh, thing they were going to do for MTV, and so we saw that. And we we're like, well, we got to get uh, get on that on, on their tour because they they like us, they've heard of us, and this is a time when you know we got on a major label, we weren't really doing much. Uh, we the, the label had forced us to get a manager. You know, we had already been together for ten years. We weren't really clicking with the manager. He couldn't really figure out how to sell us. Everybody had their own ideas about what we should do. So we were like, well, hey, Nirvana likes us and they're popular. Let's us like try to get on this these shows. So we did, and then and th meanwhile we'd been fighting with the label over the single for um, from Too High to Die. Mm -hmm. um, they had really liked this song that I had done, which was like a, a parody of of um, basically it was a, like a parody of Chili Peppers or whatever, just this goofy kind of send up. And they took it seriously and they heard grunge. It was like a parody of grunge. And so they thought that we should do this as a single. And Kurt was like, no way. And I was like, no way. This isn't a Meat Puppet song. And they made us record the damn thing five times before they finally rejected it. In fact, <laughs> we, uh, I think our final session was like a $20,000 session for the one song. I think it was at Sunset 
uh, one of your previous guests mentioned that there was a Prince room. So I think yeah. it was Sunset. Because yeah. I remember Prince, Prince coming in and we were being told, do not leave your room when Prince comes in. He does not want to see any other humans. Wow. So uh, I think that must have been Sunset. Yeah, and, no, it was Studio C at Sunset. I spent a couple of weeks in, in the Prince studio there. And, and that, was a, that's, that was a great room, the one we were in. It was like that room, you didn't need any baffles. You could just set the drums up. Everything was set up. The, the sound was great. Um, unfortunately, the version of the song we did was awful. And um, finally, the, the label gave in, gave Backwater to Dave Jordan to mix. And then they said, fine, we'll just do this one. And in the meantime, we were like, all right, we're going to get on this Nirvana thing. And it just so happened that Nirvana was going to be doing um, their unplugged thing right after we had done our dates with them. And uh, Kurt Cobain was like, Kurt, you got to teach me your song, man. I can't figure it out. And Kurt was like, yeah, sure. I'll teach you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, maybe it'd be better if I just came on the show and helped, helped <laughs> you play it rather than teach it. So um, we, they were like, fine. Of course, they were terrified to, to do this show. At least Kurt was terrified to do the show anyway. So he was glad to have his buddies come out. And so we, uh, we rushed back to Phoenix, canceled a couple of dates to uh, oh, we canceled a date to get back to Phoenix in time to fly straight back out to New York. I didn't have to go because they didn't need me. And I was uh, just as happy for that. I didn't, didn't need another uh, flight out to New York that quickly. And so they did the thing. Um, MTV was very unhappy to find out that they had chosen us as their special guests. <laughs> they were hoping it would be somebody they'd actually heard of. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, in the meantime, uh, you know, like our, our manager didn't want us canceling the show so that we could go out there. This was something that we had pretty much concocted on our own. And at the end of the day, Kurt was like, yeah, I don't want to work with this manager anymore. Uh, he's all, all these things that are make are happening for our band are happening because I started it, not because of him. What are we right. paying him for? That kind of crap. Um Never and heard so, that story before. Right. It's well, it kind of gets gets back to um, what's relevant to uh, to your, your your rock stars out there. Yeah. Is that um, the artist can be mighty damn temperamental. <laughs> well, I was on a tour with a, an artist in a band who fired the manager on tour, uh, actually because the manager said that. Um, oh goodness, what was it? Uh, that that. Um, oh, I can't even remember. But we got. Well, I just the manager got fired on tour for just referencing the wrong band and, and saying oh, yeah. that they sounded oh, yeah. like reggae or something like that. Well, we, we used to have, um, when we would get, got to New York after we had signed, uh, with the London polygram, they were most distressed to find out that we would, uh, play for an hour, go off stage, come back for an encore and play another hour of like songs. We didn't know that we would just jam out and like everybody would leave and we hadn't even noticed. And our manager would have to come back and go, guys, you're like, you're you're driving your audience away, and this was you know, <laughs> this was the difference between 1982 and 1992. Yeah, really. Well, so um, so that was pretty remarkable that you guys got. Oh, did did you go on stage too for the MTV Unplug thing, or was that just Kurt and Chris that that just, went up just for that? Just Kurt or? and Chris. Just okay. Kurt and Chris. Okay, yeah, I was. Um, I you shared the video with me too. So, rock stars, I'm going to include YouTube links and videos to stuff we're talking about. Uh, in the show notes, so you can go check it out and uh, go click through and listen to the records easily. And um, I, I, I can uh, tell you this much: um, uh, 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 Dave, uh, their drummer, used those weird kind of um, bamboo uh, uh, groups of sticks, really right, thin right. sticks, to hit the his uh, to play his acoustic stuff. And this might be jumping ahead to a my favorite hardware tool, but I went and bought a pair of. Uh, wooden like salad spoons from the uh from like the fries grocery store or something uh -huh. and that's how i used to play um the my acoustic sets because we were doing acoustic stuff unplugged too because it was so popular and um y y y the thing that I've, i learned over the time for like to get my thing in the studio and on stage was there's this this weird balance that you have to to kind of get so you can kind of make the drums a dance so you're like kind of leaning forward on it and you're you've got um enough bounce to so you're not playing too hard not too soft so you're not struggling um and you're kind of like you've got some momentum and i learned for instance that if i change my drum heads every third day there are three different uh sets of, of drumsticks that i need to use i need to use an old set that's been really whittled away 
because we played hard and I used to chew my drumsticks up a lot. Mm -hmm. And I would play those on um, night one when the skins were still kind of tight. And um, then I would play like brand new sticks on the last night when the skins were loose. And then I could play uh, six that were just right on the, the middle night when everything was perfect. So one of the things I learned was like the situation is going to be different depending on how you feel, what the situation is. So how do you make those slight adjustments so you're always going to get your thing every time? Yeah. And uh, so little things like like that that I learned over time t that could like get me that – because there's, there's that certain kind of bounce that you've got to get or else it's like just – you feel like you're hitting a pillow or you're hitting like a brick wall and what you really want is that kind of sp spongy uh, live – uh, performance that uh, that took me the longest to learn. Well, it's interesting. I mean, you know, you make the point of the value of doing stuff repeatedly so that you can say, all right, I know that when I, you know, have this drum head, I need this stick. And, um, and that allows you to have a consistency. Yep, exactly. Well, so uh, I was also remembering when you guys, uh, when the Nirvana Unplugged MTV show was done. I thought I remembered reading an article that Bob Clear Mountain had recorded it or and mixed it or something. Does that sound familiar to you? Would you know? I'll be honest. The only thing I know about the unplugged session was uh, how it affected my bank account. <laughs> well, I'm glad it did, and I don't. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it was a bad effect, right? No, definitely was not. All right, that's great. We sold more of those records than we did probably all of our other other records combined. Yeah. And just imagine, you didn't even have the internet then. Well, I was going to say you. Um, we, we have your the question that you say is your favorite hardware tool. I already shared my spoons, but you know my what what hard piece of hardware I'm the most glad I don't have to use anymore is which one? The phone card. Oh yeah. Oh man, I think I had one dangling around in my wallet until recently, Ugh. and I finally threw it away. It's like a some sort of a <laughs> weird eleven digit number you'd have to dial so that you could actually communicate with your your accountant or your agent on Friday and and, and Monday. Well, now uh, the only difference that I do miss is uh, when you were in the car driving, you couldn't be on the phone and you couldn't be reached. So therefore, you could just hang out and listen to music, and you'd have to physically pull over and find a payphone if you wanted to call somebody and say, you know, I'm going to be late or I'm going to be early or or whatever. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, we had a tour manager when we were touring with uh, Stone Temple Pilots. He had worked with Mark E. Smith of the Fall, uh, and. Um, uh, he quit the fall because uh, Mark Smith put his hands on him and started uh, roughing him up. And he, he gave the guy the name Computer Boy, which we continued to use because he had like a, a dot matrix printer and um, a, a laptop. And he was preparing our European tour. So he would get up at like three in the morning and print out these damned like dot matrix printouts and faxes. And um, – <laughs> That was the only computer stuff we ever dealt with in our career, in yeah. my career anyway. Bzz, and you, bzz, yeah, you, you couldn't share a room with him because he uh, not only did he snore, but he had that damn printer going all the time. Wow. All right. Well, so let's um, get back into the studio here for a moment because rock stars, uh, we you know love to hear talk about recording, recording, recording as well. So let's they've let's, tuned us out. They tuned us out a half uh, an hour. No, no, no. They're they're waiting. They're ready and waiting. But um. Let's talk about you recording your drums in the studio again, because really, I, I love the sound of your drums. They sound almost like drum machines, even when they're not. Um, what advice do you have? Tell us about how you would have recorded a drum kit or what the space was like. Um, are you in a big room? Or are you in a small room? Is it kind of dead? Just t talk about all the basics if you were going to describe the way you recorded. Well, I'll be honest. We recorded in all different types of ways. We, re we recorded some records slow, some fast, some in crummy studios, some in good studios. And really, you know, if there are any drummers out there who are haven't yet learned this, you have to learn to be flexible. I mean, that's that's the bottom line. You have to know your material and you also have to know yourself. Um, one of the things we noticed, uh, well, what what one of the things we used to say is that uh, rock and roll is the opposite of sports because nobody ever wins or loses. And yet you're going to come off this, off of a, of a performance feeling like it really sucked. And then you'll listen back to it and realize it was the best one. And then consequently you may think something was really great and listen back to it and it wasn't so great. Hmm. So, um, I don't think there's any real, uh, real, real secret to how we, we recorded it per se. Um, certainly I liked a clean sound. I used to admire, 
Hal Blaine, um, another fella I really used to admire, oddly enough, is a guy named Earl Young, who played for the um, uh, MFSB and the South Soul Orchestra. He was like a Philadelphia soul disco drummer. And another uh, disco guy named Lauren Rinder, who was a, uh, a Motown guy before he got into disco. So I always really admired those precise beats that weren't flashy, they weren't sweaty. I didn't like a lot of fills. I really focused on the snare. Um, I, I liked to add color with my hi-hat and not play a lot of cymbals. Mm-hmm. And, um, and of course, my, you know, my, but my, my uh, bedrock was punk rock. I mean, that was what, I, what got me interested in playing music. And so there was always that energy component. But mm-hmm. what I learned in the studio was that you can't rely on energy in the studio. In fact, some of our, we had, we had good experiences with high energy in the studio, but we also had massive failures. So what I, you know, my, my approach to, to drumming was to just keep it very, very simple and to try to pay attention to every, you know, every sound, every well, beat. Well, one of the things I would say is as an engineer, um, I really appreciate that you do- aren't doing a bunch of crash cymbals and there aren't cymbals all over the place. Cause that yeah. is one of the things that makes it challenging to actually get a great uh, in your face sound out of the snare drum, for example, is there's just mm-hmm. too much cymbals bleeding through that snare mic. Yeah, um, so and I'll it, tell you what, I had to f- fight the, the 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 other members of the band on some of that stuff. Keeping it simple, you know, they were like, "You got to play more like Peter Chris," or you know, "You got to play more <laughs> like you know, uh, heavy metal." But uh, I wanted to keep it simple. I wanted to ground our band. I mean, we were so you know, off the wall with jazz, psychedelic country, you know, all this stuff. And I always wanted to ground it in, in pop. And I wanted the music, the drums to, you know, to lay that simple groundwork. So I always kept it simple. Um, I I I think that's what absolutely made it work. Well, I I think so. And it's one of the things that makes us um, uh, unique. I'm not a, uh, I mean, I I haven't played the drums in 20 years. You know, I'm once, once the band broke up, I, I didn't, continue i was really dedicated to the meat puppets i thought it was a real interesting um musical project i thought that the 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 brothers were were real interesting and unique people i thought very highly of myself and um it wasn't like i just wanted to to get on stage and impress girls it's like once uh i got out of the band i was like nothing like (laughs) there's not not going to be anything that's ever going to top that so all right well quick question about recording drums and then i want to go to uh you know 20 years forward to the reissuing on Ryko disc what do you remember about the mics that were around the drums do you remember that you guys used to like to have like stereo overheads or mono overheads or is it really everything just kind of close mic'd to get that sort of sound that you would get oh we definitely used um, uh, stereo overheads definitely uh and you know it's very close mic'd um Clo- cl- right, close, um, right up against the uh, the bass drum, you know, up mm-hmm. inside there. I mean, I didn't pick out the mics or anything like that. I wasn't that concerned about that kind of stuff. I again, I tried to focus on, you know, you let the engineer set it up. You don't have a lot of control over it, so you listen and then you adjust and try to get your thing based on what that engineer is set up. Now, here's the thing: you you got to keep in mind. I, I don't want to offend your your um your listeners. But I am an IT professional. I do do support for a lot of people who don't mm-hmm. know anything about computers. And a lot of your musicians, especially ones with a heavy live vibe, they're going to be highly suspect <laughs> about coming into the studio. <laughs> they're going to look at that bank of your favorite toys and think that that's going to be in the way of them getting what they think they should be getting. It's up to the engineer and the producer to sometimes, you know, convince the band, you know, what they're bringing to the studio is, is great, but it has to be translated, you know, the, the normal kind of a stuff. Um, so my approach is always to try to find a way to get my thing and get comfortable and get satisfied in all different uh, environments. Hmm. It wasn't always easy, but uh, I always reached a certain level of, of success. And sometimes it took longer than others, but I'm not a studio drummer and I never... I mean, I'm not like Hal Blaine, who had his own like three or four different kits and had cartage and had guys going in and setting up and making sure it was the same way from studio to studio. I didn't have that luxury. I needed to make sure that 
think of it an, another way to look at it is when we used to get our photos taken for like press photos or for um, you know the media or whatever. I learned real early on that they're never going to pick the photo because I look good. <laughs> so I had to look good in every picture. I had to always, I learned how to like, because there were some pictures where I really look, didn't like the way I looked. So I learned how to like strike a pose and be ready when the camera was on so that I was going to look pretty much the same from picture to picture so that the other guys could fight between themselves over which picture to use. And I always looked great. That's and I think fascinating. It's, it's, same thing with the drum. With the drums, a good drummer has to know how to sound good in every um, in every situation. Now, any studio drummer knows that. But once you get to be a good studio drummer, you get to call some of the shots because they're paying for you. But they were never paying for me. They're always paying for the band. And I had the luxury of having a long enough career. And part of the nice thing about the Meat Puppets early career was it was in the shadows. You know, we had small budgets low stakes we could experiment a lot um and when it came time to finally like put the rubber to the road we were ready to cash in not all uh, bands of our ilk got to play you know have a 15 20 year career um fooling around as much as we did mm -hmm. so usually you you know i don't know what it's like anymore because um uh, i'll be honest with you by the time i was uh 1995 rolled around and you know, like I said, I had a strung out bass player and a cranky manager. You know, we're kind of in between pressure from the manager and pressure from the label and pressure from the fans. Are we too loose? Are we not loose enough? I wasn't sorry to, you know, to, to, to change careers. I, yeah. I found uh, getting into computers, getting into, I mean, I did a lot of home recording. I uh, did a couple of things on my own that just for fun. I didn't, didn't miss... Um, any of that <laughs> was uh, too high to die. Was that the last record that you did? Or was it we did a, we did a record in 1995 called No Joke, which was um, not particularly well received. Um, by that time, my bass player was already badly strung out. He probably spent more time in the bathroom than uh, he did tracking. But it was our first Pro Tools, our only Pro Tools session that we did. Oh. And um, I remember saying. To the asking the engineer to give me one bass tone and one kick drum tone, which he put like on a floppy disk, and I've got it somewhere. So if I ever wanted to sample it, and uh, that was, you know, I mean, storage. Uh, I mean, I did so many recordings on my own uh, at home after that, and I don't even have the sessions because I'd had to compress everything, and I could only choose what I wanted to save and what I couldn't because I didn't have the storage. Well, I wanted so, to ask you what, what your take is, sort of having experienced analog recordings and digital recordings. Do you have any, you know, takeaway from analog versus digital? Um, I think nowadays it's way better. It's a lot more, more, lot more fun. Uh, I mean, I do a show for LuxuryMusic.com where I basically take records that I've either found online or I've ripped from my own collection. Um, and then I just, you know, Put, this, put them together, add the segues, and then record my own basic tracks. And I just, I, I'm sure that you edit your podcasts down quite a bit. Um, but I, I love being able to just like, you know, flub my way through a, a, a track, um, cut all the bad parts out, throw a bed underneath it, and you can't tell the difference. Right. Uh, yeah, for sure. And I, I remember doing fun things like um, I had some really crummy, crummy uh, gear. I'd like, a, I don't remember the name of the, it's like it had an 8 bit. Um, sampler that a friend of mine sold me for like a hundred bucks. And I used to make crummy uh, string sections out of those. I remember I used to play drums electronically and then I would go in and just change all of the sounds around in MIDI so that they weren't drum sounds. And so there would be like, you know, kits being played by birds and wind and stuff like that. I just got such a kick out of that. Now I'm not suggesting to your audience that this is a good way to make a living at this, <laughs> but uh, I mean, let's, let's put it this way. When I got into it, in 1979, fooling around with tape machines, if I could have had a digital setup, it had just been a dream. That's, we just used to, we loved to just fill four tracks and then bounce them down and fill three more and just make the, the, the most noise we could. Well, I have to say, personally, I am definitely a big fan of the tone of the first three records that I really knew of yours, you know, two, um, Up on the Sun and Mirage. I just love the tones on those records. So. Oh, I, I agree. And of course, um, 
Uh, obviously, Spot did the first two you mentioned. Mirage is actually uh, engineered and co-produced by a fella who worked with uh, Keith Olson, and he had moved to Phoenix, and uh, we we got you know we got a different, an entirely different uh, vibe from this guy, but. Uh, you know, we he was still a fan of of nice clean tones. Well, so, tell tell us about Spot. Uh, I'd like to know more about him. Well, S- Spot, I'm all you really need to know about Spot was like the highest compliment he could make about a recording was that if it was gelatinous, and that <laughs> that was his uh, term. So we hit it off. You know, he he understood. I mean, that I I wouldn't want to try to redefine gelatinous it says it's uh, said it's at all that's what you're looking for a spot was who you were recording those records with and was he producing as well uh i don't think the the meat puppets ever gave away a production credit until we were forced to by uh london polygram we always considered ourselves to be the uh producers per se right, right. but um you know S- spot worked with black flag of course and the black flag records always had this really kind of crummy sound uh, the bass was always kind of buried. Um, you know, they they obviously played really loud in the studio, and he had limited amounts of control. But um, and that's how he came up. But he was able to work with a a, a diverse group of artists once uh, SST came around. And he was more or less their house producer, and he was was really quite good. And he know, knew how to be laid back. Um, he uh, he was able to keep the sessions real comfortable. He was a lot of fun. Um, and, you know, he's he's still out there and he's he's like uh, the rest of us, uh, you know, like myself, a curmudgeon who only wants to do his own shit. <laughs> well, let's transition now out of the studio and and sort of stay on the topic of labels a little bit. Um, you guys started out sort of in that SST world. You you moved on, you know, a decade later towards the, the London polygram world with Too High to Die. And then uh, later on, you produced the re-releases, the reissues with Ryko Disc. Um, You made a comment that I thought was pretty fascinating. Uh, I always imagined that you guys went through this process of um, the pressure of being more pop, more like, you know, radio around the time of Too High to Die, and that you were really trying to please labels. And, you know, you're just going through that kind of classic scenario. But you (laughs) also said back, I guess that was Meat Puppets too, when SST, you were afraid they weren't going to put out your record because it wasn't punk enough. And I love that, you know, on one end of the spectrum, it's like, you guys aren't, you know, you're not, you're not anti, uh, yeah. um, you know, establishment enough to be released. Well, and then later it's like, you're not establishment enough to be released. And so just talk about that whole kind of arc. Well, and, and once, well, first of all, we had started out with, um, uh, we had a, a band, um, named monitor had taken us under their wing initially and they were kind of part of the art punk rock scene of los angeles with bands like b people and uh wall of voodoo um human hands um and they were not your even even your traditional um hollywood punk rockers uh but they were much more uh, already more avant-garde um, we got our first uh, start in the studio recording a track on Monitor's album where we worked with Ed Barger, who had recorded Devo's first singles. And uh, their their stuff had already been set up and it sounded great. We just went in and, and raged for five minutes and had a record. Getting involved with SST, um, suddenly we were we were not punk enough for SST's audience. And of course, when the hardcore movement came into the Hollywood scene, there was a lot of tension because it brought in a lot of people who were not as so-called open-minded. You know, suddenly, you know, with the advent of hardcore, you know, gays were not were no longer as accepted. Um, Decline things, of things, Western civilization, right? Pretty, Part pretty much, I'm afraid so. So when we suddenly went to SST, first record we did was at Unicorn Studio, and of course, if you know your SST history. Black Flag had made a deal with this label, Unicorn, to do distribution. It went very bad for them, and we were right in the middle of that. And SST had a lot of like hangers-on that were like a lot of skinhead kids, young kids, dropouts, uh, runaways, whatever. I don't know what what the hell they were thinking, but they all looked at the Meat Puppets like they were not cool because they had long hair and they smoked pot and um, one of the reasons we stopped making hardcore music, aside from the fact that it was essentially limiting, was that um, 
they used to like spit and throw things at us when we would open for Black yes. Flag and do other SST uh, shows. We we had um, some terrible experiences. There was probably the the most amazing one is when we opened for the Misfits in uh, in San Francisco in 1982. And even the Misfits, their their reputation had preceded them. But when they came to town, much to the horror of the hardcore skinhead crowd, they were not skinheads. They were like, you know, comic book fan types. Right. And the, the crowd started. And we opened with um, The King and I from, um, um, what the hell is that? My Fair Lady? No, right. The King and I. No, Bali High from The King and I. Nice. And... Um, they began spitting and throwing stuff at us, and we were like, "Screw this!" And we left. We did our so, show. So and we the split. spit, the spitting is we don't like you, or we do like you. <laughs> we, in this case, it was we don't like you, and yeah. they began throwing things at the Misfits, and the guitarist got so uh, got you know they, he was so harassed that he like slammed his guitar down on the head of uh, one of the fans, and they like ran out of town with the cops after him. Wow! Um, the crowds were not not cool and so we were like well we're 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 out of this hardcore thing we don't we're on this big hardcore label we don't like hardcore we're gonna play country you know we're gonna play soft we were really into neil young and stuff like that and uh we were gonna do music like that and we were real concerned that sst was going to sabotage the project i don't think that's accurate but at the same time uh, Husker Du was doing Zen Arcade for SST, and the Minutemen were doing Double Nickels on the Dime, and even Black Flag was trying to rehabilitate their hardcore uh, brand with um, their a more he- traditionally heavy metal style, which they uh, debuted on the My War album. And we were like, at the time, we just did not know, you know, what direction things were going, and we were a little bit concerned, trying to to branch out outside of this like initial punk rock hardcore kind of a thing as it turns out it took out took off really well in fact um soon enough we got left behind and you know your who's produced and your replacements started getting um signed um rem was getting popular in the meantime black flag was like sinking hmm. and we were just like oh god if we made a mistake nobody and we, but, you know we, we tried to get signed and we had one guy Went into Gary Gersh's office. I don't remember. I think he worked for Electra. I'm not sure. And we went to his office. He's like sitting there with his uh, in his stocking feet, telling us how he sold. He signed. Um, I think it was Dead or Alive, just because of their look, because he knew they could he could sell their look. We were just like we're we're sunk. We're <laughs> we're 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 never going to get anywhere in this business. And um, you know there was a lot of problems. You know our our guitarist had twin children and we were trying to make a living doing this we had to work our asses off and we um didn't feel like we had a lot of support from our our indie label Mm -hmm. and so you know we were by the time we left sst we were not sorry was the next stop was uh london polygram correct yeah well so talk about that talk about the the shift in the music industry i mean there was like um the post nirvana kind of gold rush yeah i can tell you in the late 80s Bands like Chili Peppers were starting to get a little bit of a splash. Um, mm-hmm. A big band back then was, um, of course, Jane's Addiction. They were um, yep. making it through, and um, you know we we got we got signed. And what, what, what did we end up doing? We were going to get signed to Atlantic. There was a fella that wanted to work with us, and then the the, the wall fell, and. He was Azerbaijani, <clears throat> so he quit the music industry to go back to Azerbaijan and help his country, you know, come out from under the Iron Curtain. Wow! So we lost we lost that connection, and his boss um, took us under his wing, and he was like, "I'm leaving Atlantic. I'm going to re-establish um, London as a as a label for Polygram. We want you guys to wait for like a year before we can actually sign you." And we had meanwhile. <laughs> here's the thing. He had come in and said, we'll release um, Monsters on Atlantic. And Kurt was like, oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, we'll, SST would be glad to do that. And F- SST was like, yeah, no way. We hate major labels, and we've already sunk money into this, and you can't have it. We don't care if this is good for you or not. And so wow. we burned our bridges with SST because, um, you know, on one hand, Kurt had given uh, Atlantic – 
his promises that we would deliver this record and SST would not deliver it. And then we were, he turned around and told us that we had to wait a year to do anything. So Monstrous came out, we toured through that, it was poorly promoted. And that was the other thing about a band like, uh, a label like SST is, it's the old story, your record's not in the shops. So we would go on, we went on tour with Black Flag and the same time we were on tour with them, they had My War Out, we had Meat Puppets 2. And in the middle of this tour, Rolling Stone reviews Meat Puppets 2 and gives it four stars. And uh, you can't find it in the record, but you can find stacks and stacks and stacks of My War. Wow. And we were just like, fuck this. So by the time we wanted to move to a, a, a major, we were like we're killing ourselves on the road. And we're, you know, our records aren't getting played. We can't find them. We're going to either... <clears throat> signed to a major or we're going to quit. So we stuck it out and, you know, we hadn't quit, but we couldn't work. We were like literally making ends meet by trying to play every uh, weekend in Phoenix. And when we had like burned our bridges with the four clubs there, we would go to uh, nearby towns and play then and then start the whole thing again. And so we were struggling to make ends meet while we could get this deal together with the majors. So, mm. you know, that's one of the things about being on a major label right there is, um, it's your timetable. And then after making us wait, we're like broke as crap and we're in, in debt and our, uh, you know, we're not paying our taxes. And so they're like, OK, you're signed. And of course, the, the uh, contract was terrible. And I think um, the Kirkwoods gave the contract to one of their uh, backstage dope buddies who happened to be a lawyer to look at the contract. And it was like, <laughs> whatever, you know, and um, yeah, it was like nine record d deal we hold all the uh, the reins you get whatever we say kind of deal and then they said oh by the way you have to get a manager or else we're not going to deal with you so they the label started getting meetings for us with managers and it was like this was at the time when i started stealing uh towels from hotel rooms because i was flat broke and they would put us up in these really expensive hotels where you couldn't get a cup of coffee for under five bucks. And it was just like, going, oh, God, what have we done? <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, we finally get this manager who broke his crap and we start getting these gigs. And he like makes us buy vans so we can haul our gear around. So he puts us more in hock. And then he's like going, oh, and by the way, I'm taking 10 percent of your earnings. And we're like, holy shit. And then and then he goes to the label and says, these guys are broke. We need you to advance them a whole bunch of money. <laughs> and so wow. that was his 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 big thing was to try to get us out of hawk. That was his major contribution, and um, and then he tries to get our records back from SST because he's like the the handshake agreement you have with SST is lousy. They're ripping you off. Whatever he starts telling us, and um, starts rattling that saber and manages to get us all sued by SST oh, from man. some of his, um, for, for like defamation of character. And then that dragged on for a while. So at the end of the day, we were like, all right, the label won't put out our records. They're going to force a manager on us. They're going to force us to work with a producer who doesn't understand our music. And they want us to record singles we don't want to record. <laughs> and so at the end of the day, we fired the manager Luckily, uh, Kurt Cobain saved us. Mm -hmm. We um, we were on MTV like all day long. After I mean, I, 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 I don't. I'm not trying to say that he saved us by committing suicide, but we were on MTV every day for like three months. And yeah, there was a backlash. People were like over it. Yeah, it didn't. Act, I mean, it helped us in some ways, but it we weren't able to recover from that success. Like it probably of, closed the door at the same time. It sure did. And of course, you know, by the time our follow up to Too High to Die came out. The labels had already kind of separated the wheat from the chaff. There were the bands that were like a lot of them were there were a lot of drug casualties in those um, initial signings of the uh, of the, the independent bands in the, the 90s. And here's another thing you have to consider if, if it isn't already obvious enough is that they cherry picked all the good bands, signed them up and killed their competitors. They destroyed the indie indep uh, independent distribution network. And um, suddenly uh, labels like SST couldn't function because they're all the good artists, quote unquote, um, were taken by the labels and they couldn't make ends meet with the artists that were not signed. Distributors were folding. So when you get right down to it, it was a it was a co-option of the yeah. you know independent scene. Um, so they basically signed everybody up 
gave everybody enough rope to hang themselves and then kept those artists that were willing to play ball with them. And then a year later, it was all about the Spice Girls. <laughs> wow, fascinating, man. What a story. What a journey. Well, um, Derek, let's take a break for a second. We'll come back in for the jam session and uh, hit a few last round of questions. But incredible stories, man. I'm, I'm I, glad I, you just went off on that, that long journey there. Rockstars, we're going to take a break here and then come back in for the jam session. Before we go, I want to remind you that you can find show notes to everything we're talking about at recordingstudiorockstars.com. Just search for Derek using the magnifying glass, or if you're on your iPhone, just go through the podcast app and uh, click on the logo there with your finger and it should turn into the show notes and you can just click right through. I'll include links to things like some of the YouTube clips and uh, maybe I can throw in a, a Spotify playlist or something like that so that you can quickly check out some of the music. Also, if you are interested in um, getting some of the music from the podcast itself, some of my own music, I'll put out a little independent music pitch here. You can check that out at skadooshmusic.com, S-K-A-D-O-O-S-H music.com. That's all my original music and the podcast music bed. And then if you want to get yourself a cool t-shirt, let the world know that you're a rock star, you can find that at rsrockstars.com slash t-shirt. See you guys in a moment for the jam session. Hey everybody, it's Lid Shaw, and I want to thank you so much for listening to this episode of Recording Studio Rockstars. I really appreciate you, and I really appreciate your time. And as a way of saying thank you, I've created a special mix tutorial just for you, Rockstars, totally free, called the Mix Master Bundle. With it, you get over two hours of detailed videos watching over my shoulder as I mix a song in my studio. Plus, I give you the free ebook that explains how I recorded the tracks, and you get downloadable multi tracks so that you can practice your mixes, including the Pro Tools session file, using nothing but stock plugins in Pro Tools, all of which you would find in any other DAW, whether you're on Logic or Studio One or Reaper. Maybe you're struggling with trying to improve your mix technique, or maybe you just simply don't have access to multi track files or can't record a full drum set in your studio. I wanted to give you a chance to create your own mixes from full drum kit, bass, and guitars recorded in my studio. The song is called American Winter, and it's off my instrumental record, Skadoosh, and it's all available for you totally free right now. All you need to do to get it is text Mix Master Bundle to 33444, and I'll send it directly to your email. Again, that's Mix Master Bundle with no space to 33444, or you can go directly to mixmasterbundle.com, enter your email, and I'll send all the files directly to you. Thanks so much, rock stars. We'll see you guys in the jam session. Cheers. Hey, rock stars, we're back. It's Lid Shaw. You're listening to Recording Studio Rock Stars, and my guest today is Derek Bostrom of the band The Meat Puppets. Derek, you ready to jam? I am ready to jam. Sweet. All right, dude. When you were starting out in recording and in music, what was the big thing that was holding you back? Um, lack of talent, lack of experience, probably coming from a punk rock environment where it was all about letting go, you know, learning how to control what we were doing. Um, so I would say uh, that was pretty much it. Is um, The recording studio was a huge shock to us when we first came in. We didn't know how to sing. We didn't know how to play. Um uh, consequently, a couple of, of records we released we weren't real proud of. So uh, probably experience. It sounds like you didn't let that get in your way either. You know, you kind of just continued and persevered and kept going, which is the the key to getting through all those well, challenges. Well, that's that's the other part of it. That's part of, of, again, working through the suck. You have to learn when to let go, what to ignore, how to drop stuff, and you need to be able to understand what's gonna, what's important. It's not always good sound. <laughs> And another nice takeaway from what you said before was you go in with an idea about what you think you want and what you're supposed to do to get there. But ultimately, the key was to just step back, listen to what's coming out of the speakers, yep. and then sort of, you know, pivot. Yep. All right. So now how about some of the best advice you remember receiving? Well, uh, 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 one of the, the things that we did get from... Uh, uh, joining a major label was they kind of insisted we take some lessons. Uh, they asked our, our singer to take vo voice lessons where he learned how to sing from his chest instead of his throat. 
very important. Mm -hmm. um, I took some drum lessons where I learned how to hold my sticks. I learned how to pop a snare, you know, how to tune, how to d figure out where the sweet spot was on a drum and how to get it. You know, how to hit hit it. It's usually about as big as a quarter. Consistency, and, right? Yep. How to, how to get power without having to hit hard. So some of the best advice, you know, I got was to like bite the bullet, stop being so um, damn high and mighty, practice and take some lessons. Well, uh, rock stars, I want to offer a little takeaway from that. One of the things that we have a tendency to do as engineers is, you know, really want to understand how to use compression to try and control sounds <laughs> and control tones. And one of the first places we go with that is to the drum sounds, because, you know, what else do we record with 13 microphones and try and get it to sound amazing and be judged on when the final record comes out. But really the takeaway is the best way to get a really fantastic and consistent kick and snare is to have a drummer like Derek actually playing it consistently every time so well, that it's recorded that way. Yeah, you want to definitely um, work with your engineer, or, or if you're an engineer, you want to work with your drummer. Um, I came up in the 80s when I pretty much uniformly despised all of the drum sounds I was hearing. You know, things like the, the, the real heavy digital reverb and heavy compression sounds of bands like, you know, even bands that I like, like Love and Rockets uh, is one that comes to mind. I just hated those drum sounds. And uh, I was I felt like I was working in a vacuum and, and, and shouting into the abyss trying to play clean, um, quiet, you know, takes. And, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to, to know that people appreciate it. Yeah, they really did. I did. I still do. Thank you. Um, well, so right now, how about sharing with us a recording tip hack or secret sauce, something that our rock stars could use in the studio today? Well, uh, most, a, a lot of what I've been talking about already is, um, you know, uh, especially f for a drummer is, it's easy to get your thing when you're in front of a, uh, a crowd and you're, you know, everything's going well and you've had a couple of drinks and whatever. It's not so easy to get that fun that if that's how you define yourself, you know, in that experience, getting to the studio, you're going to find yourself really out of your element. And one of the things I learned was how to get my, my bounce, how to make the drums a dance. Um, it's kind of hard to describe. Um, it's, it's not really a, a tip or a hack. Um, most of my my hacks come from my my IT world, which is to say, like I'm really into plain text. You know, I don't <laughs> like to I don't like to fiddle. Um, you know, I, I like something that's um, I, I like to remove remove barriers. Um, so probably the biggest recording tip is to get out of your own way. Um, don't let your ego get in the way. Don't fight against the other members of the band. Don't fight with the engine here. God, I don't really have a specific recording tip, but everything I learned was like school of hard knocks. <laughs> well, you you did share one, and I'll bring it back um, as relevant to what you just said. You do go into the studio, and it's uncomfortable, and it's alien initially. Mm -hmm. You're like, whoa, what's this sound? Or, you know, in the same way that you go to sing a, sh a song on stage for the first time, and you hear your voice coming back through giant and loud through the PA, it really throws you off. Yep go into the studio and you play your instrument and then you hear it through headphones and that could be really unnerving. Yep. Um, and you had said earlier that you, you eventually learned to go in ahead of time, you know, yeah. set up the night before, Definitely. have some time to actually kind of get comfortable with that new instrument before it was time right. to go. I could tell you another tip, so to speak is, um, I mean, I can't tell you how many, uh, gimmicks that I tried and discarded, and went back to the regular, like everything from like floating uh, drum uh, tom rims to like weird little springs on the cymbals, anything that would like, it's just like the baseball player that always eats chicken before uh, a meal or something like that, or always wears the same, uh, uses the same glove. Yeah. There's all these little tricks that make you feel confident. And uh, when you finally come out the other end of that and you realize you don't need any of that stuff, but still, you know, try it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now um, we'll ask you a couple of these ones that you sort of answered already, but we'll let you riff on it some more. Favorite hardware tool, something physical that you really liked having with you when you were hitting the studio? Oh, I liked having a, um, does a, a, a drum tech count as a hardware tool? <laughs> sure. Yeah. I, a human hardware. Find, yeah. When I finally uh, got to the point where I was, you know, in 1995, when the, it's the sort of kind of ended, I was like addicted to good sound after having spent 15 years learning how to get it. And it was just like, Oh, now I've, I'm, I have, I only own like three 
mics of my own and I no longer get to have like the full panoply of, of like uh, people at my dis- my disposal and everything. So uh, I, I really enjoy having a, 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 a good drum tech around, <laughs> good rental. You know, <laughs> so, yeah. you made a comment just there. You, you talked about finally learning to like good sound. Um, yep. That the meat puppets play into that for me. So I have to say that I discovered you guys. I, I loved all those records. And then I went off and I traveled and these, you, you talked about some of the records that I didn't mention. This is the period mm-hmm. where I sort of like took off and I spent a year traveling and then I moved down to Nashville and I went to recording school. So now all of a yeah. sudden I'm in school and I'm learning new stuff and they're playing records that I didn't like before, but I'm sort of learning right. to like them. And you come I, back around, once you've learned stuff, you come back to your old favorites and suddenly you understand maybe why you liked them. Well, I um, did actually. I did. I did, and I didn't. I have to say, I came back and I listened to my favorite early Meat Puppets records, and all of a sudden, I was like, I was like, oh, that sounds out of tune. Yeah, and, <laughs> and sure I was does. like, and and I was like, what was it, man? I I I loved this, but 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 I didn't notice these things, and then it took a little bit longer before I f- quit worrying about all these new things mm. that I learned, you know. Um, Oh yeah, clear glasses on, and I went back and I listened again. I'm like, oh yeah, of course, that's why I love it because it sounds fucking great and it feels great, you know. I have the same problem on on alternate days. I can listen to my old stuff and think it's the best, and sometimes I think it's the worst. Uh, Honestly, you you can't even you 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 your own opinion amounts for nothing. (laughs) You just have to to push through and and do what you believe in, and not worry about what even what you think about. Because really, you know, once you once you release any work of art into the world, it's not yours anymore. Oh, that's so great that you said that. That's a Leo Canellan quote, um, bringing it back to Chris King. So Leo was the poet laureate of Connecticut, the main poet that we talked about. And that was his advice to us. He says, once once he made his work and you put it out there, it's not yours anymore. So he didn't mind what we did to it. And that's, of course, I most of what I do now is write. And writing is probably 10 times harder than playing the drums, at least for me. Hmm. Um, you are constantly looking at a line going, this is just not good. I'm, I'm tired of messing with it. The uh, problem with writing, of course, is that you can mess with it end, endlessly. Yeah, really. Whereas, whereas with, a, with um, music, it's like when you're on the clock, it's like, well, up to a certain point, uh, if you're not going to get it, they'll bring in Alan White and kick Ringo out. And with digital writing now in blogs, you can even go back and re-edit what you've published. <laughs> you sure can. <laughs> All right. So now how about sharing a favorite software tool, something or something you just want to recommend uh, that you think is really cool? Well, um, some of your guests really key on like organizational stuff. And that's really, you know, what what I, I'm into now. I mean, again, I'm a big fan of ubiquitous capture and u- ubiquitous retrieval. I like plain text. I like low friction solutions. I like something that um, if I can jot down an idea or anything, um, I'm another one of those guys who carries a um, a, uh, a a field notes notebook and a, uh, a, a space pen in his pocket. In fact, mm-hmm. that's my favorite hardware tool right there. A space, a space pen? Wait, the one that you can write upside down and all that? You can write upside down. You can write in in a freezer. And the best part is, is it won't break in your pocket. And you can get a small one that will uh, you can stick in your watch pocket. And I never leave home without a pen and a, and a cool. notebook. I can't wait to leave a link to the Spaceman pen in the blog post. I mean, it, it's got to be good if you're going to spend like 20 bucks on a pen. <laughs> I, I, I love my space pen. All right. Now, um how about uh, any any resources or tips for the business side of music <laughs> and doing this? You know, maybe it's software stuff, maybe it's just advice, maybe it's uh, people to that you should know about or that you shouldn't know about. Well, I think that uh, my advice would be the same one that I might give you if I was a uh, a famous hockey player. You've got to diversify because eventually your band's going to hit the skids and you're going to be uh, looking for a job. Uh, I got into, uh, you know, I I was fascinated by engineering. Uh, I, I, I used to travel with the, my road crew. I liked to, uh, see what was going on in the studio. Uh, and once I, uh, no longer, I was able to pivot from being a drummer and I moved into computers. I was able to produce, um, a, a, a series of, uh, reissues for a uh, Ryko disc, which I really, uh, really was really satisfying to me. So I would say, you know, diversify. If you're an engineer, le- learn to play an instrument. If you can't already, if you're, if you like one part of it, uh, make sure that you're diversifying because uh, things change fast. I mean, we were talking about that 
with your last guest, uh, Chris Graham, who looks like sounds like uh, another reader. <laughs> mm-hmm. I've read, read a lot of the books that he mentioned. I, I would say the the best res- the best business advice is to diversify. Well, I know Jody Stevens. You know, he talked about that. There's when- n- another guy, and another guy who got into business. I mean, that's n- another good tip is um, don't resist the business part. I mean, I talk about how the uh, the major labels were kind of a souring experience, but uh, I learned a lot from it, and everything I learned has set me in good stead. You know, I I am really glad that I know what I know about even the tough parts. Yeah. Well, one of my favorite stories was another friend of mine, a punk rock drummer um, from a band that never really broke out, but they they were sort of well-known locally in St. Louis. And when the band finally broke up, his his light bulb went off in his head and he said, you know what? I think I'm going to finally go to coroner's school. So he became, he worked for the <laughs> city coroner of Nashville doing autopsies. He and, wasn't in the dead, was he? <laughs> no. Yeah, right. And then, uh, and then after that, he he transitioned to become a chiropractor, and I, I think he's a successful chiropractor with his own office. And cool story, you know, nice transition. Well, they always say that uh, musicians always want to be comedians, and comedians always want to be musicians, and apparently engineers always want to be architects, or vice versa. So, last couple of questions here are the hypothetical ones. Mm-hmm. Um, if you were going to start out in recording again, and you needed to have a simple setup to record with, you needed to find people to record and um, you had advice for somebody about making ends meet, what would you use? Where would you find them? And, and what would you do? Well, uh, to me, the, the way I can relate to that question really is only like the, what I said before about diversifying. You know, once um, the band ended and the money ran out, I had to, you know, go back to work. Um, in this particular instance, um, my wife and I were vegetarians and she was like, well, you should go work for this Whole Foods that's opening up uh, down the street. And then you can uh, work in the produce department and learn about food, and maybe we can open a restaurant. And I was like, whatever. And, uh, of course, I was broke enough to go ahead and try to get a job at Whole Foods. Worked in the produce department for a while before I transitioned to working for in IT for them, which is much more rewarding. But um, I'm going to basically say don't be afraid to start at square one again. Uh (laughs) I think that's – I mean, if you're dropped into a strange city – don't set your sights too high. All right. Well, so now let's go to the final one here. And this is the one you were hinting at before, too. Um, we're going to take the Wayback Studio machine here, and you're going to go back, Derek, and find young Derek and tap yourself on the shoulder and turn around and say, what are you doing here? And you say, well, I've come to give you this bit of advice. I want to tell you the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day. Well, if this was about me, I would say, young Derek, you are right. Everything is going to be fine. <laughs> nice. So young Derek knew everything was going to be fine? He did. He followed, he followed his instincts. And, the, and this gets back to the, the spiritual thing, which is kind of what we started with. It's like, um, you know, why are what are we doing here? You know, we need to learn how to be comfortable in our skins, be comfortable in the moment, live in the moment, don't resist you know, some people like to say live every day like it's your last. I'm not necessarily saying that, but don't live your life the way other people want want you to live it. Live it the way you want to live it. But and this gets back to that goofy quote I gave you at the beginning. You need to know what you want. You know, yeah. so if you I would say, you know, the, the most important thing you can do is is follow your instincts. I'm glad I did. Um, like I said, I haven't played in a band since 1995. I can't say I'm sorry. I'm I've I'm fascinated with with business. Um, I'm interested in the work that I do now, um, and I'm interested in, in my life. And I think it's important. Uh, but let me let, let put it to you another way. The, the same kind of question I asked Hal Blaine when I interviewed him in the late 80s, and he said that during his most successful time. When he had like, you know, five kits set up in in five different studios all in one day and was going from session to session, he had lost track of himself. He had lost his his family life, his personal life, and he did not realize that his wife was um, was struggling to the point where she finally committed suicide. Wow. So I would say that the single most important thing you can do to become a rock star of your life is to um, make sure you know yourself. Yeah. Well, that's good advice. I think that's great advice to go out on. Oh, I got one more thing for you. Please do, please do. Um, I kind of mentioned it before, 
but I just wanted to, to underline it. A lot of your artists, especially younger artists, are going to come in with a certain level of resentment and resistance to the studio, to the meddlers in their perfect s sound. You, the engineer, are going to have a target on your back because you are meddling in their perfect, perfect art. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> you probably experienced that. I always think about um, the story of um, the second Grateful Dead album when the producer stomped out of the uh, studio and refused to work with the Grateful Dead because uh, Phil Lesh asked for the sound of thick air. <laughs> um, you know, just remember that, um, and I, I, I have this every day at work, um, non-technical people are going to ask for things in non-technical language. So you need to make sure that you're, um, you're building that bridge with, with people who don't understand what you do and don't know anything about the studio and don't know how to communicate what they want. And how do you build that bridge? Uh, you you listen. <laughs> Just you listen. I, was, I would say don't feel too superior. It's a lifelong process to to learn to see yeah. a, another person's life through their shoes, as they say. But I think it, it does really help in the studio when you're an engineer if you're trying to, you know, work with artists. And I don't know what artists are like anymore. Maybe they're all. Maybe we're all industry hacks now, and there are no. Uh, crazy psychedelic uh, pothead musicians that no, are trying no, to. We got some. Make, we got some. I, I just wouldn't know. But um, everybody's got their own home studio now, so everybody might come in with a little more prepared than we were in 1981. But I think it's important to uh, to find to find a way. Everybody to, knows just enough to be dangerous. That, that that speaks volumes for me, man. Well, so now, Derek, um, let our listeners, the rock stars, know how they can learn more about you, how they can find you, and follow you, and reach out to you. Well, I uh, probably own three or four um, uh, domains that all point to the same website. Uh, I own meatpuppets.com. The uh, the poor bands didn't get into uh, uh, the actual meat puppets didn't uh, figure out the web until after me. So they own the meatpuppets.com. But if you go to meatpuppets.com, you'll go to my website. Um, it's, it's also derekbostrom.com and derekbostrom.net, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's my main repository and you can get my Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and uh, Tumblr, uh, links from there. Rockstars, that's D-E-R-R-I-C-K -R and then B-O-S-T-R-O-M. Correct. Well, so Derek, thank you so much for joining us on Recording Studio Rockstars, man. What a trip to just go down all these stories with you and, um, just take a trip through, uh, the 80s and the 90s and, and the Meat Puppets and all the places you've been. It's really cool well, to hear all those stories. Well, well thanks for the uh, the opportunity for me to, you know, try to work out my, my own damage by uh, uh, vocalizing it. And I'm sorry for, uh, that your audience had to listen, provided <laughs> you, provided you uh, make the biggest mistake of your career and release this. Uh, not at all, man. Not at all. I think everybody's going to love it. Um, and you know, what was a real pleasure for me too, was going back and just re-listening to the, all the records, getting ready for this and remembering how much I loved them and how much I loved the sounds on them. So rock well, stars, I highly recommend you go check out the meat puppets. It's the same thing with me. I've, I'm really delighted. Chris, uh, made me aware of your show and I've been subscribing to it and I'm going to dig into the past episodes. All right, groovy. Well, Derek, thank you so much, man. I look forward to seeing you, uh, if not around the studio, then I'll see you around the internet. All right, thanks a lot, Lidge. All right, cheers, man. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw. And this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. <laughs> <laughs>